Okay, good day again to all of you. So, uh, chapter four is all about requirements modeling. And the specific task in requirements modeling is here in chapter five. We have data and process modeling. So, what are the steps or what are the diagrams that we're going to create in order we could represent the data and process modeling? So, let's start our discussion in chapter five. So, the chapter objectives describe data and process modeling concepts and tools, including data flow diagrams, a data dictionary, and process descriptions. Describe the symbols used in data flow diagrams and explain the rules for their use. Draw data flow diagrams in a sequence from general to specific. Explain how to level and balance a set of data flow diagrams. Describe how a data dictionary is used and what it contains. Use process description tools, including structured English, decision tables, and decision trees. And describe the relationship between logical and physical models. So for the introduction, so starting from this chapter in chapter 6, you will develop a logical model of the proposed system and document the system requirements. So the logical model shows what the system must do and then the physical model describes how the system will be constructed. So overview of data and process modeling tools. Systems analysts use many graphical techniques to describe an information system. And one of them is the so-called data flow diagram or DFD. This uses various symbols to show how the system transforms input data and into useful information. Okay, data flow diagrams or DFD for short, shows how data moves through an information system but does not show program logic or processing steps. A set of DFDs provides a logical model that shows what the system does, not how it does it. So actually the process uh, the processes that we're going to discuss here are called black box because uh, it shows what uh, it shows how it uh, what is done but not how it is done so these are the following dfd symbols okay we're using two types of symbols we have the gain and sarson symbols and the jordan symbols um, for me the most commonly used as i've seen in the books is the gain and sarson symbols but then again um they can be used but they cannot be used uh, as a mix-up, no. If you're going to use Gain and Sarson, use Gain and Sarson. If you're going to use Jordan symbol, then use Jordan symbols exclusively. So let's uh, have a uh, let's have a an agreement. It's better to use. It's not better. Let's use Gain and Sarson symbols for uniformity and standardization of the DFD symbols that we're going to use. So let for the discussion, let's just see the difference. So the process. Is, this is for the gain and Sarson symbol and then uh, a circle for Jordan symbol and then data flow of course it has an arrow and the data to be transformed or to be transferred from one process or from one entity to the other just like the same with the Jordan symbol um, for the data store they are similar it's just that uh, for the left side of the gain and Sarson uh, you will put here the number of instance of the data store and then for the external entity so customer has a uh, shadow uh, square with a shadow and then customer is just plain flat um, square so again for uniformity of using symbols that's use gain and sarson symbols okay first is we have the process symbol the process symbol receives input data and produces output that has a different content, form, or both. Because, of course, um, it's like in a computer, data, and then when it's processed, it becomes information. So the data will be transformed to another form. And then it contains the business logic, also called business rules, and referred to as black box. As I've said, black box, it does not show you how it happens or how it uh, how it is done but it only shows you what is done okay so we have another one we have the data flow symbol okay 
let's just uh, see, for example, these are the correct implementations of using a data symbol and a process symbol. But let us finish the description for the data symbol. Then let's go, uh, let's go back with the illustration. So the data flow symbol represents one or more data items. The symbol for a data flow is a line with a single or double arrowhead, single if it's unidirectional, and then double arrowhead if it is bidirectional. Then it has a, sp a spontaneous generation, meaning you have one input data, but the process can produce many uh, data flows outside, uh, going out from the process. Okay, we have this black hole. Okay, black hole means, uh, as you can see for in science, black hole means if you entered a black hole, there's no way out. Uh, for this um, type, black hole means you have an input for the process, but that process does not have an output. So that is an example of a black hole. So what is a gray hole? So gray hole is, um, example, you're going to calculate the employee's salary. That's the process. The input is student's grade and then computed salary for the output. That's already a gray hole. Why? Why do you need a student's grade for, uh, for you to calculate the employee's salary? So that's an example of gray hole. R uh, wrong data, but the information that is uh, going out from the process is correct. Okay. So, we also have another, it's not just, uh, it's not mentioned here, but I, I read in an, uh, an article about TFD. There is also so-called miracle. Miracle is, an, is opposite of black hole. You don't have any input, but you do have an output from the data flow symbol. Meaning, you did not put any information, uh, any data, but then the process um, has an information going out. So that's a miracle. So the, again, let's go back with this one. So these are the correct implementations of using the process symbol and the data flow. So okay, for the data flow, uh, what we're going to put here are nouns or this one, services performed. This data will be will be transferred to create invoice. And then, uh, as you could notice for the process symbol, since this is a process, you sh it should have, uh, it is a transitive verb. A verb and then with a direct object, create invoice. And then, you're going to, um, it's not, imagine, you're going to analyze. If the process create invoice is finished, what is its byproduct? So, we have invoice. Uh, uh, there are many instances that, what is written, for example, create invoice, what is written in here will be the output. But it's not always the case. But I'm saying majority of the uh, output or the information or the byproduct of the process uh, came from the process lab uh, symbol label itself. So this is an example. This is correct. Next is our process is student, uh, grade student work. So our data flow is submitted work. Of course, you need the data of submitted work for you to grade the student work. And then after you're, you finish a grade student work, you will have the graded work for the output or byproduct of the grade student work and the student grade. It is two. So that's why that's the so-called spontaneous generation. So this is also this is an example that not it's not the case that if you do have the student work it will be also the uh, the output of course because grade student work student work here is not yet graded so of course if you're going to analyze if you are finished with the student work what will be its output of course it is already graded and that graded work has a corresponding student grade so this is another example okay next is we have the process calculate gross pay. So what is the data that is needed for uh, the calculate uh, gross pay? We have hours work and pay rate. Okay, so you need that uh, two data, hours, hours work and pay rate. And then what? Uh, and then you're going to ask again, 
what if calculate gross pay is finished? What is its byproduct? So we have gross pay. Just like the first example, uh, the gross pay will also be the output. Okay, next is we have, this is also a correct implementation. So the data flow, again, always remember for the data flow, you should put noun. So the data for order, and then you have to verify order. Of course, after you verify order, what will happen or what's its byproduct? So its output will be, since it's already verify, verified, the order is already accepted. And then this data would be the input for assemble order. And then what will happen or what is the byproduct of assemble order is we have inventory change. Inventory change meaning that you're going to add additional product because you have um, assembled the order. Okay, these are correct implementations of process symbol and data flow symbol. Okay, next is we have the data store symbol. It represents the data that the system stores. The physical characteristics of a data store are unimportant because you are concerned only with a logical model. Because data flow model is a logical model. So again, you don't care if, it, if it's stored in a server, in a blade server, or just in a hard drive, in a computer. What is important is uh, the representation, again, because it is a logical model. So this, again, are the correct implementations for um, a process symbol with a data store and data flow. Okay, we have this process. Uh, do not assume that uh, this is the only, uh, the only um, D DFD. There are only uh, snippets of a DFD so that you could have an example. So not the gen a generic or very big DFD that you're going to show. So for simplicity. Example, we have a process process which is post payment and then its byproduct is customer payment and then this data will be stored of course in the data store daily payments and then this daily payments what are the byproducts or what information does this uh, this data payments data store has we have the daily payment and it will be a uh, need the, the needed data for prepare deposit Another example is we have create invoice, of course. What is the byproduct or what is the finished product? If create uh, invoice is finished, then you will have the invoice and this will be stored in the accounts receivable. And then as you can see, we have it, uh, we have a, a two, uh, two directions. One going to uh, accounts receivable, going to post payment, and then the data flow is invoice detail. And then another one from post payment, we have the payment detail and it is stored in the accounts receivable. And then for admit patient, another example, after you admit the patient, what information you will have? We have the admission form and then this admission form will be stored to patient's data store. And then from this uh, data store, you can uh, view the, in the data for symptoms and this will be an input for the diagnosed patient. And then for treat patient, then uh, what, is the, uh, what is the byproduct of treat patient is we have treatment and then it will be stored in the patient's data store. So these are examples of data store symbol and how it is done. Okay, we have the entity symbol. The name of the entity appears inside the symbol. So entity symbols are... The names of it are nouns. Okay, there are so-called terminators because they are sometimes the last, uh, the last um, receivers of information. Then it is already the end. Example: You are the customer, and uh, if you already done the process of, for example, paying, and then you accepted the receipt, so that's the end of the whole logical model process, and then you are the terminator. If uh, your can uh, the entity symbol can also be called a source because, for example, if you're the customer, if you're going to pay, so to start the transaction is you have to pay. So that's uh, that's why you are called the source for the information. And of course, sync sync is you are accepting the output of the process, but not necessarily 
you are already the terminator sometimes uh, the one that you accepted as a uh, data or information it is the input to the next process so in this uh, on the left side you can see the correct and incorrect examples of data flows so it is correct process to process then we have this data flow another process to external entity this is also a correct example or process to data store this is also a correct example so what are the wrong implementations for data flows first is external entity to external entity external entity to data store and then data store to data store so how are we going to correct uh, this um, wrong implementations actually the only technique here is for two entities they must have a process entity or process symbol in the in the middle. Also for the ent uh, entity and the data store, a process symbol in the middle. And for both data store, a process symbol in the middle. Because it, uh, if it is connected entity to entity or entity to data store or the same as data store, what will happen? What is the process? So that's why this is wrong. For every entity, for every uh, data store, and for every data store connected to another data store, there must be a process between them. They cannot be connected directly. So how are we going to create a set of DFDs? So create a graphical model of the information system based on your fact-finding results. First, you will review a set of guidelines for drawing DFDs. Then you will learn how to apply these guidelines and create a set of DFDs using a three-step process so what are the guidelines for drawing dfts so draw the context diagram so that it fits on one page so a context diagram must be fit to one page only and then use the name of the information system as the process name in the context diagram or the process or uh, the process zero then use unique names within each set of symbols do not cross lines because the more complex your dfd is it's difficult if you're going to cross lines for the data flows and then you're going to be confused where is the where is the actual the label of this data symbol is it this one or that one if they are crossing lines and then provide a unique name and reference number for each process and then obtain as much user input and feedback as possible okay before we going to uh, draw or create DFT, you have to remember that it's better or it's easier to create the DFD if you already have a list of steps for a business process. It's difficult if you're going to create a DFD while imagining it. It's better, again, um, if you're going to create a, a set of DFDs, you have to have already a step by step process or procedure of how this business process is done. Okay, so for this examples, it is assumed that it has a documentation, a step-by-step -step procedure. Okay, so draw a context diagram. Um, actually, um, um, in my in my own case, as as I know how to how to create DFDs, uh, I have another technique. I always start with the diagram zero, and then last is the context diagram. But but mind you. But in presenting DFDs, it's always the context diagram to be presented first. Um, I'm going to show you why I'm doing the diagram zero first and then last is the context diagram. So again, let's go first with a context diagram. So this is an example of a grading system. So it is said that uh, the grading system, it also already has a process and then its ID is process zero. Okay, so we have external entities or entities, student record system. Okay, entities can be persons, can also be a separate information system or an institution. So that, uh, that uh, these are the common entities. And then, of course, another entity, we have a student and instructor. So from the student record system, it will provide the information of class roster as input to the grading system. And then the student as input, it will uh, submit uh, its work and then it will be, uh, in, uh, it will be uh, placed in the grading system. 
And then we have we have this one instructor grading parameters. It's their input to the grading system because the grading parameters. Example, uh, fifty percent is for the ma uh, major exam, five percent for attitude, five percent for project, so on and so forth. That is the grading parameters. And then coming from the grading system is we have the final grade, which will be stored in the student record system. And then from the grading system also, uh, after submitting the work, there's a graded work to be given to the, back to the students or returned to the student. And then for the instructor, since he or she has provided the gra grading parameters, uh, the grading system will provide a grade report to be given to the instructor. So, process zero represents the entire grading system. Okay, again, context diagram contains the process zero. Uh, that's why I'm emphasizing because uh, in the next slide, maybe you're confused. I just want to clarify that uh, that is process zero, the process that is contained inside a context diagram. Okay, so we have step two, draw a diagram zero DFD. So, this is already the context diagram from the previous slide. Okay, again, process zero is different from diagram zero. Do not be confused, okay? It, uh, diagram zero is not context diagram. That's a very, very big mistake. That's it's already been the mistake of those who are creating information systems as their thesis projects. But then when I review their document, they are always mistaking that the diagram zero is the context diagram. It's a different diagram. Uh, how it is? Uh, how is it differ? Okay, let's go back again to the context diagram. So the context diagram is this one. It contains, as I've said, process zero, which is the grading system. This grading system, if you're going to expand it or you're going to explode process zero, you're going to produce diagram zero, which is this grading system. Its expanded or exploded version is this one, the uh, process one, process two, process three, and then process four, and then we have the grade book. Okay, so again, context diagram is different from diagram zero because context diagram contains the process zero. And if process zero is expanded or exploded, it will produce this diagram, which is the one it is, uh, which is called the diagram zero DFT. Okay, so this is again the exploded version of the process zero. Um, this regarding, of course, the entities because it is included in the context diagram. Okay, so th this one. Okay. Um, why am I saying in the previous discussion that um, in my practice, I always start with diagram zero? Um, for me, it is easier because as I've said, it's easier to create DFD if you do have already a step-by-step -step procedures. You're going to analyze if the step-by-step procedures can be combined, can be omitted, or is it the original step-by-step -step procedures? And then, for example, if it's the original step-by-step -step procedures, uh, for example, for the grading system, Okay, what are the identified step-by-step -step procedures? Okay, uh, it is identified. They have four procedures. We have established grade book for process one. Process two is assign final grade. Process three is grade student work. And then process four is produce grade report. So, again, for uh, student record system, it will output its class roster that will be needed by process one, establish grade book. And then, since class roster, and then we already have the grade book, what will be its uh, byproduct? The class grade book, and it will be stored in grade book, which is data store one or D1. Okay, then the instructor will input its grading parameters to establish grade book and then for process number two assign final grade so how are you going to assign final grade it's by uh, getting grading detail from the grade book and then also 
um, assign final grade, this will be uh, the byproduct of assigned final grade of, is of course, the final grade. It will be stored in the student record system. And this final grade or also, as you can see, this will also be stored in the gradebook data store. And then for the process number three, grade student work. So after grading the, uh, the student's work, you will have a grade student grade. And then this will be stored in the grade book. And then another one is we have the, uh, uh, again, in the process grade student work. The output is graded work and it will be given back to the student. And of course, before, before it is graded, the student must submit the submitted work. And then for the fourth process, produce grade report, um, it needs the class detail for the input. And then after uh, the produce grade report, it will have a byproduct or an output of grade report and it will be given to the instructor. So this, will, this is an example of the diagram zero. As I've said, why do I need to create first the diagram zero? Because if you already have a step-by-step -step procedure and then you have already identified the data store, it is easier to assign the data flows from that you're going to make to the uh, from the uh, on the context diagram example uh, um, student record system because it's uh, the same with the context diagram you're going to identify so from the student record system uh, it uh, it out outputs the class roster so as uh, you can see this is the class roster and then also from the grading system uh, it needs the final grade as input as you can see th this is the final grade for as input to the student record system and then for the instructor as you can see in the diagram zero we have an output grading parameters going to the process so these processes are included in the grading system so as you can see it is also going to the grading system and then another um, it will accept the data grade report so as you can see from the process so it's included in the grading system so we have the grade report and then for the student uh, it will um it has an information it will output an information to be submitted to the grade student work so we have submitted work so for the student submitted work going to the grading system and then of course it uh, the graded work from the process number three will be returned, graded work will be returned to the student. So as you can see, the graded work will be returned since process three is also in included in the grading system. So uh, for me, it's easier to create context diagram after identifying at least the diagram zero DFD. Okay. If the same data flows in both direction, you can use a double-headed arrow. If same data flows, okay? But if there are different data flows, of course, you cannot join them in one data flow symbol. Diagram zero is an exploded view of process zero, as I've said. And then we have the so-called parent diagram. So let's go back to the context and um, diagram zero. So process zero... This is the parent diagram of diagram zero, okay? And then vice versa, process one, two, three, and four are the child, child diagrams of grading system. And then we have the so-called functional primitive. Uh, this functional primitive means, example, let's go back again. Example, establish grade book. If this established grade book does not have any more um, separate sub steps, for example, how to establish a grade book? Number one, get the class roster. Number two, then so on and so forth. If you can still identify sub steps for this process, it means this process is not yet a functional primitive. You have to explode it to another diagram. Okay, if you explode process 1, process 2, or process 3, process 4, the exploded version of 
uh, process 1 will be called diagram 1. Okay? Uh, diagram 1 DFD. Okay, next is draw the lower level diagrams. So, must use leveling and balancing techniques. So, leveling examples. Use a series, series of increasingly detailed DFDs to describe an information system. So, we have the exploding, partitioning, or decomposing. So, this is an example of, this is already an, an exploded or lower level diagram because as you can see, as, as you can see to the previous, from the previous example, it is, for example, one, process one, two, three, and four. But for this example, we have 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, meaning that this is an exploded version of the process 1. Okay? But in our case, um, it's just enough that you, you, you know how to create context diagram and diagram 0. At least the basics of creating DFT is important to be, to be learned in our case. Okay, for balancing techniques ensures that the input and output data flows of the parent DFD are maintained on the child DFD. So that's what I've, I've been saying. You have to make sure that the data flows with a, a child and parent are just the same. With the same that I, I've uh, demonstrated in the context and uh, context diagram and diagram zero DFD. Okay, um, I'll provide a separate video, video tutorial of how to create an actual DFD because it's already um, made in our discussion so that you will be guided on how to, um, uh, how to create and then you're going to think and analyze based on the list of steps that you will be having. So uh, again, a, a very good tip for creating DFD, you must already know the step-by-step -step procedures of the business process that you're going to model using DFD. Okay, let's go with data dictionary. So a data dictionary or data repository is a central storehouse of information about the system's data. An analyst uses the data dictionary to collect, document, and organize specific facts about the system. It also defines and describes all data elements and meaningful combinations of data elements. So a data element, also called a data item or field, it's the smallest piece of data that has meaning. Data elements are combined into records, also called data structures. A record is a meaningful combination of related data elements that is included in a data flow or retained in a data store. So, for data dictionary, you could use you can use case tools for documentation. The more complex the system, the more difficult it is. It is to maintain full and accurate documentation. So modern case tools simplify the tasks. And then a case repository ensures data consistency. And then case tools in part two of the systems and uh, analyst toolkit is included uh, for this uh, for the book of Ross and Black. And then we have documenting the data elements. You must document every data element in the data dictionary. The objective is the same to provide clear, comprehensive information about the data and processes that make up the system. So this is an example of a data dictionary. So it is indicated here the system, which is payroll, and then the data is November 15, 2011, for example, and then the label is social security number, alias or short term for social security number is SSN, and then type and length is 9N. So N means numeric, 9 digits. Default value is none. Source is employee application form. Acceptable values, any positive number. So that's why 9N. And then security, payroll department. So there are the ones who's go, who can only access the uh, this data. And then user responsibility is also the payroll department. And then description and comments if they have any um, uh, comments and description. Okay, then the following attributes usually are recorded and described. We have the data element name and label, alias, type and length, default value, and acceptable values, domain and validity rules. It, it, acceptable values is used for data validation. 
And then also the source, security, responsible user or users, description and comments, as you can see in the table. So the typical attributes are as follows. We have data flow name or label, description, alternate name or names, origin, destination, record, volume, and frequency. Data uh, for, uh, for that is for the, uh, the, uh, for the data flows. And then for the data stores is we have the typical characteristics of a data store are data store name or label, description, alternate name or names, attributes, volume, and frequency. And then documenting the processes. So these are the typical characteristics of a process. Process name or label, description, process number, and process description. And for the entities, so the typical characteristics of an entity include the entity name, description, alternate name or names, input data flows, and output data flows. And for the records, the typical characteristics of a record include record or data structure name, definition or description, alternate name or names, and then attributes. So next is we have data dictionary reports. So many valuable reports, an alphabetized list of all data elements by name, a report describing each data element and indicating the user or department that is responsible for data entry, updating, or deletion, a report of all data flows and data stores that use a particular data element, and detailed reports showing all characteristics of data elements, records, data flows, processes, or any other selected item stored in the data dictionary. So, data dictionary reports is composed of many various valuable reports. Okay, so we're already finished with data dictionaries. Next is we have the process description tools. A process description documents the details of a functional primitive which represents a specific set of processing steps and business logic. It should be noted that this chapter deals with structured analysis, but the process description tools can also be used in object-oriented development, which is described in Chapter 6. So for modular design, based on combinations of three logical structures, sometimes called control structures, which serve as building blocks for the process, so process description tools can be in sequence, can be in selection, or can be in iteration or looping. If, we, uh, if you can remember your programming subject, sequence, they are done uh, in, in order. And then selection, you're going to um, process a certain line of code depending on the condition or the selection. And then, of course, iteration, you're going to repeat a certain block of code depending on the condition. Okay, next is we have structured English. Must conform to the following rules. Use only the three building blocks of sequence, selection, and iteration. Use identation for readability. Use a limited vocabulary including standard terms used in the data dictionary and specific words that describe the processing rules. So structured English might look familiar to programming students because it resembles pseudocode. Again, pseudocode means pseudo false false code. You cannot really use that pseudocode in any uh, programming language because it only deals with the logic, not actual, not the actual syntax and semantics of the programming language. And then the primary purpose of structured English is to describe the underlying business lo logic. Example. We have the structured English version of the sales promotion policy. So we have this condition. If customer is a preferred customer and another condition or nested condition, if customers order more than $1,000, then apply a 5% discount. After applying a 5% discount and if customer uses our charge card, then apply an additional 5% discount. So, a person who orders more than $1,000 and uses the charge card, tot total, he or she will have a 10% discount. What if this customer who orders more than $1,000 but did not use the charge card, what will happen? So, it will fall to this one. Else, award a $25 bono bonus coupon. 
So again, uh, the order, the cost, uh, the customer orders more than one thousand dollars. So you're going to apply a five percent, but does not use a charge, charge card. So uh, the customer has a five percent discount and a twenty five uh, dollar bonus coupon. But what if? A customer is just a preferred customer but did not order more than 1,000. So, uh, his, uh, his, uh, the customer's only um, award or perk or freebie is award a $5 bonus coupon. So, uh, this is, is how you're going to analyze the structured English version of the sales promotion policy. Okay, another one is we have decision tables. Shows a logical structure with all possible combinations of conditions and resulting actions. It is important to consider every possible outcome to ensure that you have you have overlooked nothing. Okay, for decision tables, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, your digital electronics, if you can remember constructing truth table and how to construct. For example, if you have two variables, you need four combinations because... Uh, 2 raised to 2 is equals to 4. And then if you have 3 variables, so the possible combination that you should have in the truth table is 8 because 2 raised to 3 is equal to 8. And then another one, if you have 4 variables in your uh, Boolean equation, um, how are you going to represent it in the truth table? You need 2 raised to 4 is equal to 16, 16 possible combinations. So decision table is also like that. Uh, for this one, uh, these two characters, uh, these two descriptions here, these are the conditions. Credit status is okay, product is in stock. So one, two. Since you have two conditions, again, just like the principle of identifying how many combinations you have to have in the truth table, so you are going to use the um, exponential 2. So, 2 raised to 2 is equal to 4. So, that's why you have 1, 2, 3, 4 possible combinations. And then, just like in truth table, but it's not represented as 0 and 1, change 1 to y and change 0 to n or no. So, that's why the possible combinations here is y y n n and then y n y n so that's the uh, combinations for these conditions so for example in this um, uh, number one if credit status is okay and product is in, in stock so the resulting action is you have to accept the order okay what is the second condition the credit status of the buyer is okay, but the product is out of stock, so that's why it is no. Would you accept or reject order? Of course, you're going to reject order because the product is out of stock. Another one. The credit status of the buyer is not okay, but the product in, is in stock. Would you accept or reject order? Of course, again, you're going to reject the order because the buyer does not have enough Fin uh, finance or not in has, does not ha have enough money to pay for the product and of course the last condition the credit status of the buyer is not okay and the product is out of stock so it's the same no so of course are you going to accept or reject the order of course it will be reject the order so this is how you're going to create the decision table so to create the decision table you should have conditions and resulting actions and then the number of the number of the combination of conditions depending upon the number of conditions again you have to follow the if it is two two conditions two raised to two is equal to four and then if you have three conditions two raised to three is equals to eight and then if you have four conditions two raised to four is equal to 16 so that will be very uh, large and then you uh, also have the resulting actions. So the number of rules doubles each time you add a condition. As I've said, 2, well, uh, two then 4, 4, 8, 16. It all, always doubles each time you add a condition. Can have more than two possible outcomes. 
And then often are the best way to describe a complex set of conditions. Okay, we have another process description tool which is called decision trees. So this is uh, actually the decision tree version of the structured English. So um, for me, it is easier to understand than the structured English. Okay, so we have, you must create a question that is answerable by yes or no. Okay, preferred customer, if it is no, 5% bonus coupon. And then preferred customer, if it is a yes, okay, ordered more than 1,000. Okay, if it is no, you'll just give him or her a 25% bonus coupon. But if the customer, which is a preferred customer, ordered more than 1,000, so it's a yes. So, did he or she use our charge card? If it is no, you have a 5% discount. And then, if he or she used a charge card, it is a yes, 5% discount and additional 5% discount. So, that is the decision trees. It is always two-way, two answerable by yes or no. So, we have logical versus physical models. While structured analysis tools are used to develop a logical model for a new information system, such tools also can be used to develop physical models of an information system. A physical model shows how the system's requirements are implemented. So the sequence of models. So many systems analysts create a physical model of the current system and then develop a logical model of the current system before tackling a logical model of the new system. Uh, why are they doing this? So to, fur uh, to further identify what are the persisting problems in the information system? First, create the physical model and then the logical model uh, of the current system. And then you're going to create the corresponding logical model of the new system. Uh, already removing the problems that you have identified from the current system. And then performing that extra step allows them to understand the current system better. So it is an advantage, though it's very uh, taxing it that it, it will uh, have a, a more workload but but by doing that extra step there are uh, the, uh, the systems analysts can better understand the current system and then we also have this four model approach how is it done so develop a physical model of the current system a logical model of the current system a logical model of the new system plus a physical model of the new system the only advantage of the four model approach is the added time, of course, because you're still going to create the physical model of the new system. Okay. So, we have already finished with Chapter 5. So, let me read the chapter summary. So, during data and process modeling, a systems analyst develops graphical models to show how the system transforms data into useful information. The end product of data and process modeling is a logical model that will support business operations and meet user needs. Data and process modeling involves three main tools, the data flow diagrams, a data dictionary, and process descriptions. Data flow diagrams, or DFDs, graphically show the movement and transformation of data in the information system. DFDs use four symbols. We have the entity, we have for the process, the data flow, and the data store. And then a set of DFDs is like a pyramid with a context diagram at the top. The data dictionary is the central documentation tool for structured analysis. Each functional primitive process is documented using structured English, decision tables, and decision trees. Structured analysis tools can be used to develop a logical model during one system's analysis phase and a physical model during the system's design phase. Okay, so we're already finished with Chapter 5. So if you do have questions, feel free to comment and ask. And then this chapter is very important because if you are going to develop an information system, um, this is uh, important because you're going to create of course, a logical model of the system which uses the uh, data flow diagram. 
So again, if you do not have any questions, so thank you very much for listening. So I hope that you could watch for the additional uh, video tutorials that I will be providing. And please like and subscribe this video. Thank you very much. Good day and stay safe.